From the fiery Darvaza gas crater, known as the Door of Hell, which has been burning for over half a century, to the mysterious Lake Baikal, which has claimed the lives of several divers, to the numerous UFO sightings reported nationwide, the Soviet Union has witnessed some of the most bizarre and inexplicable encounters. Many of these mysteries remain unsolved to this day. What are the most terrifying encounters ever witnessed in the country, and why do they remain unsolved? Join us in this thrilling episode as we unveil five of the most mysterious Soviet cases. The Dyatlov Pass Mystery In 1959, a group of hikers set out for a skiing expedition across the northern Urals in Sverdlovsk Oblast, Soviet Union. A 23-year-old radio engineering student at the Ural Polytechnical Institute, Igor Dyatlov, led the group of 10 others. Each hiker was experienced, and they planned a challenging route to the far northern regions of Sverdlovsk Oblast and the upper streams of the Lozva River. The group arrived by train in Ivdel, a town in northern Sverdlovsk Oblast, early on January 25th. From there, they took a truck to Vizhai, the last inhabited village to the north, and began their expedition on January 27th by trekking toward Gora Otorten. The next day, January 28th, Yuri Yudin, a member of the group, had to turn back due to severe knee and joint pain from his health issues, including rheumatism and a congenital heart defect. The remaining nine hikers continued their arduous journey. On January 31st, the group reached the edge of a highland area and prepared for the climb. In a wooded valley, they stored extra food and equipment for their return trip. The next day, the hikers started moving through the pass. They planned to cross the pass and set up camp on the other side, but worsening weather conditions, snowstorms, and low visibility caused them to lose their way and veer west toward Kolatsyakl. Realizing their mistake, the group decided to camp on the mountain slope instead of moving 1.5 kilometers downhill to a forested area that would have provided shelter from the harsh weather. Yuri Yudin speculated that Dyatlov probably did not want to lose the altitude they had gained, or he decided to practice camping on the mountain slope. Before leaving, Dyatlov had agreed to send a telegram to their sports club as soon as the group returned to Vijay. This was expected no later than February 12th, but Dyatlov had told Yudin, who left the group early due to health issues, that it might take longer. When February 12th passed with no word from the group, there was no immediate alarm since delays were common for such expeditions. However, on February 20th, the worried families demanded a rescue operation. The head of the institute sent the first rescue groups, made up of volunteer students and teachers. Later, the army and police joined in, using planes and helicopters to search for the missing hikers. On February 26th, the searchers found the group's abandoned and badly damaged tent on Kolat Shiakl. The sight puzzled the search party. Mikhail Sharavin, a student who found the tent, said that the tent was half torn down and covered with snow. It was empty, and all the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. Investigators noted that the tent had been cut open from the inside. Nine sets of footprints, made by people wearing only socks, a single shoe or barefoot, led down to the edge of a nearby wood, 1.5 kilometers to the northeast. After 500 meters, these tracks were covered with snow. At the edge of the forest, under a large Siberian pine, the searchers found the remains of a small fire. The first two bodies found were Krivonyshenko and Doroshenko, shoeless and dressed only in underwear. The branches on a nearby tree were broken up to five meters high, suggesting one of them had climbed up, possibly to look for the camp. Between the tree and the camp, searchers found three more bodies, Dyatlov, Kolmogorova, and Slobodin. They appeared to have died while trying to return to the tent. They were found at distances of 300, 480, and 630 meters from the tree. It took over two months to find the remaining four hikers. On May 4th, their bodies were discovered under four meters of snow in a ravine 75 meters further into the woods from the pine tree. These three were better dressed than the others, indicating they had taken clothes from those who died first. Dubinina was wearing Krivonyshenko's burned, torn trousers, and her left foot and shin were wrapped in a torn jacket. A legal inquest began right after the first five bodies were found. The medical examination revealed no injuries that could have caused their deaths, concluding that they had all died of hypothermia. 
Slobodin had a small crack in his skull, but it was not considered fatal. When the last four bodies were found in May, the story took a darker turn. Three of the hikers had fatal injuries. Thibaut Brignol had severe skull damage, while Dubinina and Zolotaryov had major chest fractures. Boris Vozrozhdeny, the medical examiner, said the force needed to cause such injuries was extremely high, like a car crash. Strangely, the bodies had no external wounds associated with the bone fractures, as if they had been subjected to immense pressure. All four bodies found in the creek had significant soft tissue damage to their heads and faces. Dubinina was missing her tongue, eyes, part of her lips, facial tissue, and a fragment of her skull. Zolotaryov's eyeballs were missing, and Kolovatov had lost his eyebrows. Forensic expert V. A. Vozrozhdeny concluded that these injuries occurred after death, likely due to the stream's impact. There was initial speculation that the indigenous Mansi people, local reindeer herders, had attacked the group for trespassing on their land. Several Mansi were questioned, but the investigation found no evidence to support this theory. Only the hikers' footprints were visible, and there were no signs of a struggle. Despite the freezing temperatures, around negative 25 to negative 30 degrees Celsius with a storm raging, the hikers were only partially dressed. Some wore only one shoe or just socks. Others were wrapped in scraps of clothing, seemingly cut from the bodies of those who had already died. At the time, the official conclusion was that the group members had died due to a compelling natural force. The inquest was officially closed in May 1959 because there was no evidence of a guilty party, and the files were sent to a secret archive. In 1997, it was revealed that negatives from Krivonyshenko's camera were kept in the private archive of one of the investigators, Lev Nikitich Ivanov. Ivanov's daughter later donated the film to the Dyatlov Foundation. The group's diaries entered Russia's public domain in 2009. On April 12, 2018, journalists from the Russian tabloid newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda initiated the exhumation of Zolotaryov's remains. The results were contradictory. One expert said the injuries looked like those of a person hit by a car, and DNA analysis did not match Zolotaryov's living relatives. Additionally, Zolotaryov's name was not on the list of those buried at Ivanovskoye Cemetery. However, a facial reconstruction from the exhumed skull matched post-war photos of Zolotaryov, though journalists suspected someone might have been using his name after World War II. In February 2019, Russian authorities reopened the investigation into the incident, focusing on three possible explanations, an avalanche, a slab avalanche, or a hurricane. The possibility of a crime was ruled out. The Lake Baikal Swimmers In the summer of 1982, during routine military training, Soviet Navy divers had a shocking encounter with strange objects in Lake Baikal. According to leaked documents by Vladimir Azaza, a former Soviet Navy officer, Navy commanders tracked and monitored several mysterious vehicles navigating the lake's waters over several days. However, the most dramatic encounter occurred during a diving exercise. At a depth of around 150 feet, the divers saw several bizarre humanoid creatures swimming beneath them, each at least 10 feet tall. These strange beings had no visible breathing equipment and wore only thin, skin-tight silver suits and spherical helmets, despite the icy water conditions. The divers watched these curious entities for several minutes before they disappeared into the depths. There was a brief standoff as the trainees and their instructors stared in amazement at their pale-skinned visitors, who eventually turned and swam slowly away. Upon resurfacing, the group immediately reported the encounter to their commanding officer. Soon after, the instructors were ordered to select the strongest recruits with the goal of capturing one of these mysterious swimmers. A short time later, a team of seven divers descended below the icy lake surface, carrying snares and wires, hoping to trap their strange prey. They returned to the spot of the previous sighting and waited, shining their torch beams into the murky depths to attract attention. Sure enough, three silvery shapes rose from the darkness below, moving toward the group, seemingly bolder after their last encounter. When one of the instructors stepped forward, unspooling the wire noose he was holding, the response was immediate. One of the entities reached down to its side, 
pulling out a small metallic device and pointing it at the divers. Instantly, the waters around them turned into a swirling maelstrom, tossing them violently. The powerful torrent quickly pushed the helpless group back to the lake's surface. Some researchers report that local fishermen witnessed the encounter. They described seeing the divers being hurled out of the lake and into the air. Unfortunately, as they were pulled from the water, they began suffering from decompression sickness. Four of the men were so badly injured from the rapid ascent that they needed immediate treatment in a decompression chamber. Sadly, only one working chamber was available in the region, and it could only accommodate two people. The mission superior ordered all four men to be placed in the chamber together. Whether because of this decision or not, three of the men died shortly afterward. The source material from which this story is derived does not detail the Soviet authorities' response to the tragedy. It is unknown if further efforts were made to interact with or capture the mysterious beings encountered. It is also uncertain whether training at the lake was suspended to prevent further contact or loss of life. Finally, the report does not speculate on the origin of what has now become known as the Lake Baikal Swimmers. This mysterious incident is just one of many documented by those who have traveled to the region. In 1977, the Soviet Academy of Sciences purchased two Canadian-built submersibles named Pisces II and Pisces VII. Shortly after, these vessels were transported to Lake Baikal for a series of geological surveys. Over six weeks, Soviet scientists conducted 42 dives into the lake, reaching depths of up to 1,400 meters. During one of these dives, several scientists descended in Pisces VII to explore the lake bed. As the submersible floated just above the bottom, with its spotlights angled down towards the sediment, its interior gradually filled with an eerie yellow glow. Puzzled, the scientists looked out of their portholes, hoping to find the light's source, only to see it grow brighter. The illumination slowly passed overhead from one end of the submersible to the other, then moved off towards the center of the lake, where it faded into darkness. Upon returning to the surface, the team asked if Pisces II had followed them into the depths for some reason. They were told that the other submersible had stayed on the surface the entire time, with its crew performing routine maintenance. Further inquiries revealed that no other military or scientific expeditions were operating in the area. Additionally, there were only a few vessels at the time capable of diving to such depths. Consequently, the identity of the unknown light source remains a complete mystery. Interestingly, a few weeks before the 1982 incident, in May, a military search team was operating in the woodlands of Voronezh after a MiG fighter jet disappeared the previous evening. They encountered a 10-foot-tall humanoid figure dressed in a tight-fitting silver suit, similar to the creatures witnessed by the diving team in Lake Baikal. The figure immediately turned and ran into the trees. A moment later, a loud boom and a bright flash of light caught the search unit's attention. They watched as a glowing object shot up into the sky, disappearing into the distance within seconds. Whether this creature and those seen in Lake Baikal are connected is unknown. In recent times, local residents have reported strange damage to their fishing nets and cattle mysteriously disappearing while grazing near the lake. Descriptions of the culprit suggest it is over 10 meters long, with massive jaws making up over a third of its body. This has led to speculation that it might be a giant pike, grown to staggering proportions in this unique environment. Some even suggest it could be an ancient aquatic dinosaur that has somehow avoided extinction and detection. The Last Tsar's Gold On a somber day, July 17, 1918, the story of Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, took a heartbreaking turn. In the gloomy basement of a house in Yekaterinburg, Nicholas and his family faced a brutal end. They were mercilessly shot and bayoneted, bringing a violent conclusion to a dynasty that had ruled Russia for over 300 years. Yet, amid this dark chapter, whispers of a great mystery endured. A large portion of their immense fortune remained undiscovered. Recently, however, a letter uncovered from the KGB archives has breathed new life into the legend of the lost treasure. For years, people believed that the missing riches were hidden somewhere in the vast, desolate region of Siberia. This sparsely populated area a stronghold of the White Army during much of the Russian Civil War, had even enjoyed a brief period of independence after the Bolsheviks seized control of the Russian government. Despite these beliefs, the exact location of the treasure remained an enigma. 
During the 1930, Stalin commissioned numerous searches for the Tsar's lost wealth, but his efforts yielded little success. Then, during the chaos of World War II, Hitler financed an expedition to search for the elusive Golden Jewels. This mission, led by former members of the White Army, who claimed to know the treasure's whereabouts, ended in disaster. The Red Army obliterated the expeditionary force, and the treasure remained unfound. Even after Stalin's death, the quest for the Tsar's treasure continued. The Soviet government, with the KGB at the helm, conducted exhaustive searches, yet they often came up empty-handed. Now, the newly released file on the hunt for the Tsar's gold suggests that they might have been very close to unearthing it. In an NKVD interrogation chamber, a former White Army soldier named Karl Purok claimed that he and a fellow soldier buried 26 boxes laden with gold and jewels. Five miles from the Taiga railway station on the Trans-Siberian line, they fled from the Red Army and hoped to come back from the treasure. But as fate would have it, their hopes have come to nothing. The agency embarked on various expeditions to unearth the gold, but all failed. Previous searches, fueled by similar accounts, had ended in disappointment. The elusive remnants of a bygone empire remained stubbornly concealed, defying all attempts to uncover their secrets. The Petrozavodsk Phenomenon In the quiet pre-dawn hours of September 20, 1977, the town of Petrozavodsk experienced a strange and dazzling event. At precisely 4.05 a.m., a bright light emerged near Lake Onega in northwest Russia. This light quickly transformed into a shape resembling a giant, glowing jellyfish, capturing the attention and fear of dock workers starting their early shifts. The sight was especially alarming during the tense Cold War, as many feared it could be a nuclear attack. This radiant jellyfish-like figure floated silently in the sky, soon sending out slender beams of light. The dock workers, among the first to witness this extraordinary sight, watched in awe and trepidation as the bright light from Lake Onega morphed into this otherworldly phenomenon. The geopolitical tensions of the time heightened their fear of a nuclear threat. After an intense display lasting 12 minutes, the glowing object changed shape again, forming a shining semicircle before retreating back towards Lake Onega. Instead of disappearing, it seemed to rise higher, piercing through the clouds with a fiery red glow before vanishing from sight. The occurrence stirred up regional authorities, sparking demands for an explanation from Moscow amid suspicions that it might be a new test of Soviet weaponry. However, even Soviet officials found themselves baffled, turning to the Academy of Sciences for insights. The conclusion? The phenomenon was indeed real, though perplexing prompting the need for further investigation. Amidst the escalating speculation surrounding the Petrozavodsk phenomenon, an unprecedented gathering of military and scientific experts convened at the Kremlin to deliberate on the matter. They unanimously agreed that the UFO sightings warranted serious scrutiny, leading to the initiation of a state-sponsored inquiry in 1978, a probe that persisted until the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This inquiry, known as The Network, stands as one of the most exhaustive government-led investigations into UFOs to date. Under the expert guidance of astrophysicist Yuli Platov, a multidisciplinary team embarked on a mission to methodically decipher UFO sightings, transcending mere anecdotal collection to conduct a rigorous scientific examination. Initially cloaked in secrecy, The Network's activities sparked rumors ranging from encounters with extraterrestrial beings to military experiments. It comprised 20 specialized units, boasting experts in physics, chemistry, optics, and spectroscopy, all dedicated to scientifically analyzing and interpreting UFO reports. The network cast its net wide, gathering data from both citizen and institutional accounts through the Academy of Sciences and Military Observations, amassing a staggering tally of around 3,000 UFO sightings. Despite the huge pile of information collected by UFO fans like Felix Zeigel, many reports seemed doubtful. Platov and his team went out into the field to check out exciting new sightings with great care, aiming for scientific accuracy. But their journey wasn't all serious business. They also had some fun moments, like figuring out that a story from a young boy was made up, or trying out quirky ways of spotting UFOs with amateur hunters. 
When Felix Zeigel died in 1988, his followers kept on investigating UFOs. They believed these encounters could explain why some countries had better technology, like saying the US got its cool gadgets from these mysterious sightings. The Gate to Hell Known as the Gates of Hell, a massive, fiery pit in the Turkmenistan desert has been spewing flames for decades, but its origin remains a closely guarded secret. The Karakum Desert is a vast expanse of sun-scorched sand dunes, covering roughly 70% of Turkmenistan. You could wander through this arid, 350,000 square kilometer wasteland for days, seeing nothing but the endless crests and valleys of Karakum's barren wilderness. However, if you venture to the desert's north-central plain, you might come across a truly surreal sight. The Darvaza Crater, a blazing gas pit that has been burning for decades and is famously known as the Gates of Hell. During the era of the USSR, gas extraction was a tightly guarded secret, just like anything related to energy production. This secrecy means that all official records about the Darvaza gas crater were locked away in top-secret files. Even now, Moscow doesn't open these files to just anyone. That's why the story you're about to hear is still quite mysterious. In the early years of Turkmenistan's gas boom, four gas fields were discovered. By the time the 1970s arrived, the rush to find the fifth field was intense. No one wanted to be on the team that failed because they were too cautious or spent too much time on safety measures. In 1971, this intense race led to some explosive results. The most common story about the origin of the Darvaza gas crater involves a small group of Soviet geologists who ventured into the Karakum Desert for exploratory drilling. They found a promising spot, set up their rig, and began drilling. However, they soon discovered that they were on top of a shallow pocket of gas. The ground couldn't support the rig's weight, and it collapsed, falling into a newly formed sinkhole. This collapse triggered a chain reaction, opening up other sinkholes in the desert. One of these holes quickly filled with water, another turned into a pit of boiling mud. But the initial crater, right below the rig, and just outside the village of Darvaza, was the most troubling. It remained open, continuously spewing vast quantities of methane. This was a serious problem. Although methane isn't poisonous, it can push out all the oxygen in an area, suffocating anyone nearby. Even worse, it's highly flammable. With just a 5% concentration in the air, it can cause a massive explosion. If the methane keeps leaking out, it could lead to a series of explosions. The geologists knew they couldn't leave their new sinkhole as it was. Luckily, they already had an emergency solution. Flaring is a technique used worldwide to burn off excess natural gas. It's like the fires you see burning atop towers in movies like Blade Runner. In North Dakota alone, almost a million dollars worth of excess gas is flared off every single day. So, the decision to set the crater on fire wasn't unusual. But what happened next was unexpected. The scientists dropped in a grenade, thinking the gas would burn off in a few weeks. Instead, it's been burning ever since. This is the most commonly accepted story for the crater's origin. Other versions, more popular among Turkmen geologists, say the crater was actually formed years earlier, in the 1960s, and bubbled with mud for two decades before suddenly igniting at the end of the Soviet period. Some think the fire started by accident, possibly from a lightning strike. Others believe it was deliberate, but not because of worried geologists. A persistent local myth says a shepherd's sheep suffocated after getting too close to the crater's edge. In anger, he lit a tire on fire and rolled it in, sparking the blaze we see today. Whoever really lit the fire probably made the right call. While it's not great for the environment to have a giant pit spewing CO two day and night, it's better than one constantly emitting methane. While burning the methane might be better for the environment than letting it escape, it's still harmful. On April 2010, President Gurbanguly Berdimuhamedow suggested taking steps to reduce the impact of the crater on other natural gas fields nearby. In January 2022, he announced plans to extinguish the crater, citing harmful effects on local health, the environment, and the natural gas industry. A special commission was set up to find the best way to put out the fire. They are studying proposals from scientists on how to do this and have the financial support of an international development bank.
they recognize that simply hoping it runs out isn't a great option. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.